All right, we are here with Aya Badir. She's actually makes me feel like a slacker after talking to her for the last 15 minutes. Entrepreneur, inventor, interactive artist, which we didn't even talk about, and most importantly, founder, CEO of Little Bits. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So um, everyone wants to know how you started this company and why, but we should back up a little. You were raised in Beirut, born in Canada, raised in Be Beirut. How did you get here to the States then? Um, so I grew up in Beirut, it's where I did my undergrad and where my family is, but I went uh, to school at MIT at the Media Lab in Boston. And I was there in 2004 for a few years, um, and I wanted to move to New York more than anything. So I ended up after school moving to New York, worked here for a couple of years, and then started the company. But you were an engineer. I'm an engineer, yeah. You are an engineer, right. I was an engineer, I say that because I didn't make it because it was painful and dry and terrible. How, the same what, for me. <laughs> oh, so for you too. But you made it through, how come? So my undergrad was a traditional engineering education. It was a very good school in Beirut, the American University of Beirut, but it was pretty traditional in the way it's taught. So it's you know about, uh, about uh, learning books, about multiple choice, uh, experiments where lots of uh, students huddled around an, yes. an instructor doing a test, and I hated it. I right. was miserable, I wanted to quit, but I stuck with it because I made a deal with my parents. Um, and then in my last year, I went to Boston to visit my sister who was doing a program there. And I came across the media lab at MIT. And that's where I fell in love with it. I realized that there's a very different way to learn engineering, which is more hands on, more about play, more about creativity, and where engineering and technology is an enabler of all of that. And so it really changed my perspective and it changed my life. And I believe is the reason I started Little Bits. So it, it's interesting because there's a movement now in the STEM in fields to get more women in because we need to start to understand more about the things we use and we could actually make a huge impact on the world doing it. Absolutely. So the largest, the, the, um, the industries that are growing the most, where there's most demand for new jobs, are in STEM fields. And so there's a shortage of STEM graduates in general. It's much worse for women. Right. Um, and so we have to solve it in general, but we have to work extra hard to also level the playing field for women. Um, and I believe that the secret to that is to change the way we uh, teach, to make it more engaging, more fun, more engaging, and more relevant to day to day so that you understand the world around you. You're not learning technology for the sake of learning it, and you're not learning these abstract concepts, but you're learning how a light comes on, or how an elevator door stays open, or how your um, Alexa works, or how what artificial intelligence is. And if if we are able to teach in a way that feels real and hands-on and fun and playful, I believe that we can really change the ratios. And I know how none of those things actually happen. Like, I think it's magic the elevator door stays open, I have to tell you. <laughs> Sometimes it's that. <laughs> okay, so that brings you to Little Bits. So tell us, how did that germinate? So um, Little Bits uh, was a, a side project. It was uh, a little research project that, that I was doing uh, in a lab here in New York called iBeam that was just a lab for research of uh, art and technology. And uh, it was a prototype inspired by, uh, really inspired by Lego, uh, one of my favorite companies and products because it, uh, it created a generation of architects uh, and engineers that understood the world around them and help recreate it. But I believe that you need a different kind of brick for the 21st century. You need a brick that is more about technology and interactivity and software, hardware. And so Little Bits became that. Um, and initially, I just took it out to a few uh, exhibits, a maker fair uh, here in New York, and uh, lines of kids started lining up, and they started to want to play and ask questions and understand how sensors works and how lights works and all of that stuff. And I realized that there's a real uh, opportunity to make an impact and to um, inspire them to love learning and to have fun learning and to be inventors. And you brought some of them here today. And you said earlier that your technology company first then you're a toy company. We're a technology company and we play in the education and the toy markets. Um, but we think of ourselves as a technology company, so what we do is this system of electronic building blocks where each brick is essentially a circuit, an engineered circuit, but they're made very simple for somebody without any background in engineering whatsoever, and they snap with magnets so you can never make a mistake. Um, and with that, you're able to make things around you happen. You make a light come on, you have a, a sensor that senses motion, you can make things move, uh, you, can make, you can program things if you um, want to uh, do something more advanced. That is so cool, to the point where you just won Toy of the Year. 
We just won Toy of the Year. We did a partnership last year with uh, Star Wars. We did a product called the Droid Inventor Kit. Um, it was super popular in the holidays. We did really well. Uh, but to be honest, it was a little unexpected that we were nominated for uh, the Toy Industry Association's uh, Creative Toy of the Year. And just last week, uh, Toy Fair happened and we won and we went on stage and got an award. <laughs> so and it was cool. very exciting and overwhelming and really, really humbling. It was next to a lot of really um, uh, companies that we um, that we look up to uh, that have been doing this for decades. So it was really uh, exciting to hear that. You are a hundred people strong. You said yeah now? about that. So do you have like is it a room full of, like creative people trying to come up with new ideas the whole time? Yeah, yeah. It's very cool. <laughs> it's very chaotic and it's very messy, <laughs> but it's also fun. It's super colorful. There's always all these maker tools around. Uh, we have these studios where we have uh, mini kind of fabrication shops, which is really fun. And we have kids in there all the time. About every week we. We have kids come in to do user testing and play testing. You were named a popular mechanics 25 makers uh, who are reinventing the American dream. That is really cool. <laughs> so let's talk about the American dream and moving forward. Like, and how do we get more? Is this how we get more people in these fields? We start them young. We get them like figuring out how to turn lights on, and they say, "Hey, I want to do this for a living." I mean, I don't think it's a solution to everything, but for technology, I believe that it makes a big difference. I think that um, kids, when they're young, are very excited about science and technology. Yeah. They're very uh, curious. They really want to learn about the world. And around usually the age between 10 and 14 is when they start to lose interest, and girls in particular lose interest faster. Um, they're getting all these social cues that it's more important to be pretty or to be sociable or to be nice, uh, more important than being smart or being curious or being inquisitive. And so they drop off a lot. But boys drop off too because many of them are not into robotics or maybe they don't want to create um, uh, shooting games uh, and they have different interests. And there aren't enough um, tools out there that show you technology in a creative way, that show you technology that also taps into art and also allows you to learn how to code and more kind of diverse ways of play. Do you think that it's still out there, like this, these cues for girls? I mean, I, I will tell you, my son's in physics, advanced AP, something physics, and it's he might as well eat his own toenails. He hates it so much, right? <laughs> like, and it's just dry and it's physics. So, a lot like, of it is like they're going to yeah. lose him, yeah. even though he's probably smart enough to do something in the field. The girls, do you still feel like at twelve they they? Society's telling them they need to be pretty. Yeah, I mean, research has been shown uh, has been showing that consistently for the past decade. Um, research has shown that they're it's either because of socialization or because they don't have role models to look up to. So they don't see themselves in uh, grown-up women that are around the world. They see all leaders in yeah. science, technology, entrepreneurship are usually men. They're usually men of a certain ethnicity. Um, and so it's a it's a it's a combination of representation, exposure, mentors, um, and also types of um, types of things you can do. Not all girls don't necessarily want to create the same kinds of um, technology uh, experiences that boys do. They want to do their own thing, and there aren't a lot of the uh, toys and tools are made for boys. I agree with you, actually. I think like if more girls were, and we've talked about this a lot here, if more girls were told that technology could help. I don't know, save the planet or things like that. You know, more they want because girls often want to help, right? So if they can understand that technology can help yeah. make things better. It's funny that you say that because last year we ran a challenge called Invent for Good, where we yeah. invited our community to uh, create inventions that solve um, a problem in their community, uh, immediate or larger community. A lot of the participants were girls, and a lot of them created these solutions around uh, making say, recycling uh, easier or more fun, or helping somebody that's disabled or have has hearing impairment. Uh, they created devices for them. So there are a lot of these kinds of things, and I love that. it's this kind of exposure. Right, I love that. Um, you and I were talking earlier about kids and screens. Then you know, people these days say kids are on their phones too much, like. Kids are watching, I just saw a stat the other day, we, we watched something like 18 hours of mobile TV, connected TV. What do you feel about, how do you feel about all that? I'm not as afraid of the screen as I think many people are. Um, I do think that there are um, uh, productive and creative ways uh, to use a screen, and there are some that make you turn it into a, a zombie that's just consuming yeah. media. Um, where we use uh, screens in a lot of our uh, our, our products, so uh, the uh, Droid Inventor Kit, for example, the missions, the instructions, uh, the activities that you go through are on your phone. Uh, but it's about driving R2-D2 around, it's about learning new missions and doing remixing, it's about learning what you did um, and, and playing sound. So it's active. It's not just about passive consumption. Right. And I mean, and my kids have their textbooks on their 
online yeah. now. What yeah. are you going to do? Um, let's talk a little bit about how Disney got involved. Because that's pretty. That must have been amazing when you got that phone call. Yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, um, it was so we. Um, I met the head of uh, corporate development um, of Disney, who's also an MIT alum, and we were at an event. Um, and he had started the Disney Accelerator, and so uh, we talked for a bit, and he invited us to join the Disney Accelerator. And basically, within two weeks, we packed our stuff. Me and three colleagues of mine went to Disney, and we participated in essentially a three and a half months program where we came up with the Joint Adventure Kit, and that was um, that was a big partnership we did last year. That's amazing. And now Pearson too, right, is using you guys in the classrooms. Yeah. So that was uh, so that was another partnership that we did last year that we we just launched early this year. Um, the idea is that um, uh, Pearson uh, created this um, this program called Elevate Science about sort of a, a different way of learning science and engineering that is more hands on and more open ended. And Little Bits is a um, tool that is used to supplement the activities. So uh, you learn about the electromagnetic spectrum and you have an activity using that's hands on with Little Bits to learn about it. You learn about earthquakes and then you, you make something. And so it's all about learning something, making it, and then it's open-ended. So it encourages open-ended inquiry, and it's going to be, um, it launched in, um, uh, in, in Florida, and uh, the, the goal is to launch nationwide. Oh, God, I would hope so. Mm. I mean, because with all due respect to my kids' schools, I think they all could use a little something, something. Um, let's, uh, before we move on, I listened to your TED Talk. Mm. How did you get involved in that? Why did you get involved in that? Um, I've always um, admired TED, um, and um, it's it's a platform to share ideas. And I would watch a lot of uh, TED videos. And um, it's funny that when when I was growing up in Beirut, you see these things, and they're so far away, and you think I'm never gonna get there. Mm -hmm. But then when I um, I went to MIT, somehow the world feels. Uh, so much more accessible to you and you kind of get a little bit bolder to try things. So I just applied for a, a, a TED fellowship and hundreds of thousands of people apply. I know. Uh, they only pick 25 people and I got, um, I got the honor to be a TED fellow um, and then did a senior fellowship afterwards and as part of it you give a talk and that became kind of the culmination of what Little Bits launch was. But I loved what you were telling me earlier that like being around, you wanted to be around people that just basically think differently. Yeah. Um, the, the nice thing about the TED Fellows program, same thing about the Media Lab, same thing about what we're trying to do with Little Bits, is basically inspire people that, uh, that work and think at the intersections of disciplines. So artists and engineers, activists and, uh, and writers, um, uh, technologists and, uh, and, uh, and thinkers or designers. So it's people that are at the intersection of fields because they then bring a different perspective and they end up uh, really looking at a problem differently. So that's why when we uh, talk about STEM, we prefer to talk about STEAM, science, mm -hmm. technology, engineering, art, and math, because we think that you need a well-rounded education that includes technology and science, but also art and design and humanities. Um, and then you get these people that are just very, um, very fr that have fresh perspective, that are very curious, that uh, end up uh, thinking really outside the box. Um, and, and it gives rise to some amazing solutions or art or innovations that end up affecting the world. I think it's really cool. And as a liberal arts major undergrad, um, and I love that the humanities are involved in all this again. Always. All right, so you mentioned activism, and immigration is something near and dear. <laughs> yes, because I'm an immigrant, and I, as of now, don't yet have my green card. And, but uh, there was a time when your mom was trying to come here. Yeah, so my mom was born in Syria. Uh, and early this year, um, there was the uh, travel ban. Um, and so we were on the phone. Uh, she was supposed to come to New York a week after. Her and, and I were on the phone, and she was like, can I come? Can I not come? I have a Canadian passport. What's going to happen? And I was like, I don't know. You might get stopped in the airport. And then we were reading all these stories about people that were detained in the airport and not allowed in. And I was like, you know what? Just like, don't. You don't have to come now. Uh, but it affected not only me. The company is very diverse. We have about 18 different languages, about 15% of people are immigrants. Um, and so a lot of people were really shaken by that. So we ended up um, uh, buying a billboard in Times Square uh, where we wrote in English and in Arabic, uh, we want to invent the world we want to live in. Um, and the idea was to try to show Arabic in particular in a more positive light with a positive message and to try to really speak, um, speak up on issues of immigration and, but also diversity and inclusion um, that represent us. And that just goes to what you were saying too about being open to different ideas, Absolutely. different perspectives, right? 
different upbringings, different perspectives, different um, different solutions that come from your countries, um, combinations of old and new technology. It's how we're going to make a better product, better technology, more informed decisions. It's how we're going to be, I think, kinder humans. Um, so I think it all helps. I think that's all amazing. Um, before I let you go, what's next? Like, what can we expect from Little Bits? Uh, we have a bunch of really exciting things coming out. Um, so we have, uh, we're continuing to grow in two uh, verticals, the consumer vertical, which is more um, kind of in the toy space. We have a, a big launch coming up in, in April and May um, around that. And then uh, and we also um, have uh, more education products that we're launching. And we're really growing the Pearson partnership. We're invested in it. Um, we're expanding to more states, uh, and we want to be in every school in the country um, and eventually the world. I think that's awesome. And how do we find you? The website? The website, yeah, littlebits.com, um, and on social, Little Bits. Um, I hope everyone goes out and buys these for their kids and the world starts building as opposed to watching reality exactly. TV all day long. But watch this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.